Well, I understand that I'm between you and uh, fun stuff tonight, so uh, I appreciate you uh, coming to this talk. My name is Robert Barnes, and uh, there was actually a lot of debate over who would attend uh, this particular talk on this particular subject. So I have a little, uh, two little benchmarks that I want to do before we get started. Uh, the first question I have, how many people will, will admit to having ever run a benchmark? Okay, keep your hands up, that those that did. How many people have run a benchmark in the last year? Okay, how many people have run a benchmark in the last month? Okay, how many people have run a benchmark in the last week? How many people are running a benchmark right now as we speak? Okay, now we have to start a different meeting. Hi, my name is Robert. I've been benchmarking for over 30 years. And you're supposed to say, hi, Robert. And it's, the, yeah, it's, okay, that's a different meeting altogether. Uh, I did mention we were gonna do a benchmark together. In, in my experience, there are typically two types of people and it kind of looks that way. Those that are interested in finding out more about benchmarking and those that have done it and just wanna know numbers that I have to give them. I have to appeal to both types to try and meet the demand here. So I'm gonna do a benchmark. We are going to do a benchmark together right now. I have before you a container full of dark chocolate m ms I'll let you know. Uh, by the way, this is an audience participation kind of event and uh, at the end of my talk, if you stick around, I gotta get rid of these, so uh, just a hint. Um, the yes, when you benchmark, you typically need to benchmark to answer a specific question. So I'm teeing up a specific question. How many M&Ms are in here? Now, I'm not asking for that number right now. I am asking you for ideas about how we would quickly answer that with the least amount of effort. The obvious approach and one I actually tried last night, uh, not on these, I had a separate set so that I wasn't handling them. Um, I filled the container with as many as it would take to fill it, and then I tried dumping them out and counting them. There were two challenges with the dumping out and counting part. One, dumping out, I had a round table and it was flat edged and they tended to go quickly to the edge. They were slippery and they kind of skidded out. Two, I happen to like M&Ms and counting M&Ms one at a time represents a data loss challenge. Um, so, so um, but th that would likely give you the most accurate uh, measurement, assuming that you didn't suffer the eating the M&Ms challenge that I had. Uh, but that would be very time consuming, certainly boring, and um, not necessarily the fastest way to get a relatively accurate estimate. So another approach would be to take a calibrated instrument. Let's say something like this two cup measuring cup. And to take the M&Ms, pour as many of them as would fit into this two cup container, count how many there are in that two cup container, and then fill it again with as much as you could, and then do an extrapolation based on your two cup measurement. The problem with that is there are 28 ounces in here. I know this because I measured. And at 28 ounces with a two cup container, it's like one and three quarters cups, which means you're almost back to where you were with counting all of them, which isn't quite efficient. So, you could take a different approach. What if you took a smaller container? What if you took a two ounce container and measured just what would fit in the two ounce container? If you did that, you have a lot less counting to do. However, I have to tell you, having done this, A, measuring M&Ms is tough because they aren't flat. And so you get them in there and you kind of have to say, ah, oh, did I get it level? Now you have another problem. This is two ounces, we have 28. That means you have to extrapolate 14 times whatever number you count. One of the things about benchmarking is anytime you measure something, there's a probability of error. The more you measure, <laughs> the more the error. So it's likely to be less accurate to, to do that. So another approach is to use both, and, and that would be to um, count how many fit in here, and if you really wanted to be accurate, take three or four attempts at it and find the, uh, the, uh, the 90th percentile or the mean of counting those three times and then carefully measure how many ounces are, are in here and then extrapolate. So that was a long-winded demonstration of um, what I think is an important principle. If you're going to measure, you're, you're measuring for an answer, unless you're one of those people who admitted that they benchmarked a lot, and there are some people, I, I, and I'm one of them, who actually enjoy doing this kind of thing, but usually you do it for a point. And the main point in benchmarking is to come up with precise answers to specific questions. Okay. 
So why benchmark? There are often general questions that people ask. This particular question is a general one. You know, how, what's the, the probability that this platform will support my needs or this app will work? Not specific to the cloud at all. There are specific kinds of questions that I hear frequently about AWS. And those questions are things like, what instance type should I use? Or what's the best uh, c cost performance? Uh, one of the things that I find interesting is there are a lot of questions that people don't ask that they should be asking. And benchmarking is appropriate for all of these things uh, if you uh, follow a disciplined approach. And again, take that idea of getting the most reasonable answer with the least amount of effort. Uh, I'll, I'll teach you, at least from my experience, the two magic words anyone involved with benchmarking has to know, and they should, by default, always use these two words anytime anyone asks them a question. Those two words, this is a secret, but promise you won't tell anyone, it depends. Anytime anyone asks you a performance question, event, any, anything like that, if they ask you, just answer, uh, respond, it depends, and then ask a long series of questions. And hopefully, if you're really good at a long series of questions, they will forget they even started the conversation, mumble walking away, and think that they got an answer. Um, I'm being facetious here, but uh, the, the really important point is you benchmark to get specific answers to specific questions. Um, one of the questions I had up there was, uh, you know, does it matter what AMI I use, or, or um, does an AMI really affect uh, performance? Um, and it does, and it's a question people don't often ask. Uh, there is guidance on the AWS um, website around being careful about using uh, public armies. It's always cast in the context of security. And, and I have some data to show you why you need to think beyond security. So I ran a simple CPU test uh, on, uh, this was actually on M2 4XLs. So I used M24XLs for this test. I ran the test three times each on five different instances. The only difference between these instances was the AMI they were running. And the AMIs, uh, all except one, were CentOS 5.4. So you might say, well, CentOS 5.4 is CentOS 5.4. Now this graph doesn't look that bad. What you can see is there are two numbers that are pretty close. That's the, um, that's the actual AWS CentOS 5.4. I think that's the, um, that's the uh, high performance uh, AMI. And then there's a, a Ubuntu 2.4. I think that's the official Ubuntu 2.4 release. These other ones were public AMIs that I grabbed that happened to be CentOS 5.4. These numbers look OK, so some of them are less. But, but the really interesting thing was looking at the relative standard deviation. Those three bars represent how much variance there was across three tests for those three numbers, three instances that were lower in, in overall number. And the reality was, as I ran these tests, the range of results went from 9 to 20. They averaged out at these numbers, but basically it's a, it was a crapshoot each time you ran on these instances. Now, I did a little digging to find out why. All three of those poorly performing AMIs had kernels from 2008. They were uh, Fedora 8 kernels from 2008. Now, you might, you might ask, well, why are there Fedora 8 kernels from 2008 sitting around? Well, in the early days of building AMIs, uh, when Amazon first um, uh, allowed people to build their own AMIs, you had to use the Fedora 8 kernel. So basically, we're looking at a poor garbage collection in action. There are public AMIs sitting out there that have aged, that won't give you the same performance as other ones. So I'm just saying. Um, benchmarking is a good way to make sure, before you even start a test, that you're working with the best ingredients. Uh, I would like to paraphrase uh, benchmarking as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, as the best way to get an answer with the least amount of effort to reduce risk. An important point I want to I make here is that the more realistic the tests that you run are, the more likely the results that you get are going to be useful. I mean, after all, you're doing these tests to answer a question. If you don't do a reasonable test, then you might as well not try to ask the question. For example, if in my benchmark experiment we started with here, instead of starting with a full container, I had an empty container, and I said, 
how many M&Ms would it take to fill this container? The answer, by the way, from my elaborate uh, benchmarking last night was 868. Uh, uh, 62 ounce, 62 dark chocolate M&Ms to two ounces, um, uh, and with me not eating any of the samples. Um, however, if, if I had given you an empty one and I said, well, how many would fit in here? The first question you should answer, the first statement you should have, what did I teach you? It depends. And then you would ask a series of questions like, what kind of M&M? If it was an almond M&M, a lot few of them, fewer of them would fit in here. I don't even know if this thing could dispense this, by the way, so I guess I'll have to eat these. Um, but but, but uh, also you'd have to ask, how full? Now, right now, um, I did a little bit of quality control in the previous time I gave this talk, and so it's a little lower now. But uh, how full it is is going to affect the answer to the question, how many fit in there. So the, the differences between what you're testing and, and what you're trying to measure affect the reliability of the answers that you get. I should point out for, for, for people who are looking at performance, uh, it tends often to be overcompensating, meaning that sometimes people focus too much on performance and performance is one attribute of an application and it's never the only thing. So uh, oftentimes you need to think about in your benchmark, is this a realistic configuration? Is this something that we could ever support in production? And am I really testing an edge case that I'm going to have to back off the results to say, well, I can get this in a lab, but I'll never be able to sustain these results in, in a production environment. Now, I'll get off my soapbox in a second. I think another thing that's often missed in doing benchmarking is, is people try often too hard to get the best, the fastest results. And I like to use the word adequate, which at least tends to have a negative overtone. But I think what you're really looking for when you're measuring performance, particularly when you're tuning, is adequate performance. That doesn't mean it's so-so. That means it's good enough for your needs and you can stop tuning. Uh, mistakes that people typically make is they, their, their goal is to make it as fast as possible. They don't have precise goals. They didn't have a precise question to start with. And so they never know when they're done. Um, uh, there's a, a Greek myth uh, about Sisyphus whose, whose, whose punishment was to roll a boulder up the hill only to have it fall down uh, right near it when it got to the top. Benchmarking, especially tuning, can become a uh, I can't remember how you say Sisyph Sisyphus as an adjective, but imagine that I just said that very eloquently, um, that, that, that you can get lost in trying to get an answer you'll never get because you can always make something faster. Uh, the other challenge is, uh, let's say hypothetically you're trying to move a, a legacy application from, uh, from an older platform and you're trying to move it into the cloud. And let's say you have some performance targets for what it has to look like. Let's say you start benchmarking and you've been working on this for three months and you're not getting anywhere near your target. At some point you have to say, screw the tuning, we're not going to make it, we have to think about a rewrite. But unless you have precise goals and you, you lay out how much effort you're willing to put into it, you, you're back with Sisyphus on that hill. I mentioned that benchmarking is used for answering specific questions. Not all questions are specific enough. I have some examples here of questions that at face value may seem really good. I'm going to take the last one because it, it, it's sort of the most precise of those. How many unique users um, uh, could be supported on a, uh, 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 what, what instance type would it take to support 1,000 unique users running Drupal? You don't have to know what Drupal is um, uh, to, to, to know what's wrong with this question. Any, any volunteers? Good answer, but, but more. I want more detail beyond what, it, what depends. There's, there's lots. You're, I'm hearing the right answers. It depends on what version of Drupal. It depends on whether it's customized Drupal or stock Drupal. It depends on what you mean by a user. <laughs> it depends on what those users are doing. It depends what OS you're running on. There are so many it depends that at face value, this looks like a, a great, oh yeah, I'm going to go benchmark this right now. The only way you could come up with an answer that holds any water is to put a laundry list of assumptions together about what you can measure. Uh, I can't uh, go much farther about benchmarking for those of you that aren't really um, familiar with it without giving a brief history of the term. There are three origins that I will give you 
Two of them are, are debated as to the original origin. One of them is more recent. My favorite, just because of the picture, uh, is the, the cobbler analogy. Um, originally, cobblers would sit on a bench. They would have um, a, a place on their bench where a client could put their foot. The client would put their foot on the bench. They would trace the foot for a pattern. That pattern was called the benchmark. The goal there was for the cobbler to get a precise pattern for the foot so they could efficiently make copies of shoes over and over again without having to measure all the time and with a high probability of giving the customer a shoe that fit well, assuming their foot didn't change in shape. I like that one. The other historical um, reference that there's some debate over which one came first is for surveyors. Surveyors use all sorts of fancy equipment, um, whether it's for uh, surveying real estate or country boundaries or the height of buildings. And in order to do their job, they need to have reference points where they put their instruments and from where they take angle measurements and so on. And that mark, um, one version says that mark is the benchmark. The other version says for some types of measurements, they needed to actually build a temporary ledge to put one of their instruments on, and that ledge was the benchmark. Either, either case, it's clear that the term uh, for benchmarking has been in the surveying world for a while. The third and most recent origin for benchmarking, and the one that comes closest to, to the use in software, is uh, in the 80s, Xerox undertook a program to understand why their competitors were beating their pants in, 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 in making products that were selling a lot better and, and customers liked them. They undertook a deep study of both how uh, their competitors uh, made their products, how they sold them, why customers liked them. They called that whole end-to-end -end analysis of what made something good and then how they could take that in, into their own process benchmarking. Um, uh, but benchmarking is around us all the time. If you buy a car in the United States, by law, that new car has to have an EPA sticker. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, I tr tried to point out that how you do measuring matters. In 2007, the EPA updated the specification for what manufacturers had to do to claim an EPA mileage for a car. The update to the spec alone was 19 pages long. That's the update. Any guesses on how long the actual specification is? 179 pages. I've read through it. It's, it's, it's fantastically detailed. But understand that in this environment, what they were trying to do was level the playing field, make sure that people didn't claim mileage they really shouldn't claim, and try to increase the probability that customers who bought a car based on this mileage were likely to get something resembling what they were claiming. Um, I've used this analogy for a while uh, because a lot of people can relate to it because they're exposed to it. But uh, recently, there is, there's, a, there's a new news item here. Um, in, the last, in the last month, Hyundai was actually um, uh, called to task because they were incorrectly reporting the gas mileage for almost all of their vehicles. The impact of this was um, significant in that they are, there are class action suits, uh, there are customers who are now entitled to, to refunds based on the mileage they weren't getting, but imagine what this has done to Hyundai's credibility. Um, people, whether it was intentional or not, people feel like, oh, they, they tried to exaggerate. And so being wrong in benchmarking is, is painful, even if it was well-intentioned, uh, and that's why you have to remember those it depends words. Because if you can avoid at all costs giving an answer, you're less likely to be wrong. But seriously, um, benchmarking, um, I've been doing it a while. And in, in typical on-premises benchmarking, it was a hard thing to do. First of all, you wouldn't typically benchmark on a production system, something actually being used. You would need a dedicated separate environment. Getting a brand new one was typically time consuming and expensive. You had to get it in, you had to unbox it, you had to get it configured. If you're in an environment where there's an IT department that controls all of that, you're subject to, to their, their rules. One of the worst things that can happen if you did get a, get a system is, it, if you, and if you got it quickly, you might ask, why did I get this configuration? The typical reason is, it's antiquated production equipment that's not really relevant for, for production. How relevant do you think that equipment is for doing benchmarks on which you're, you're trying to make reliable predictions about the behavior of something? 
Again, the less relevant the stuff you're testing on, the more likely that your, your, the accuracy of your, result, your results are limited. Uh, it also requires huge spikes in capacity to be able to generate load, particularly doing large-scale load, particularly in today's world if you're trying to do internet scale. You essentially have to have huge excess capacity available to generate lots of load that, um, you, if you're not testing continuously, sits idle until the next round. Uh, now, this is not me in this picture, but I've been there many times. You never run a test once. You always run it multiple times. And if you're trying to do tuning or you're trying to isolate a bottleneck, you often need to carefully make changes to the configuration. Guess what? That takes time. If you're in an environment where you don't have physical access to the, the systems that you're testing, then that means you have to have someone else do it. Uh, and, and it may be labor intensive and cost, uh, cost prohibitive. What I really like about AWS is that um, you can take advantage of, of, of some of the intrinsic um, cap uh, built-in capabilities. One of my favorite things that, that people may not realize right away is you can deliver answers much more quickly. In my hypothetical example where you're running a test three times, let's say that test takes three days to run. And in order to give an answer as to whether this release is ready for production, if you run it three times and you only get one production system, that's nine days from when you start to when it finishes before you can say, yea, verily, I will stake my, somewhat stake my reputation partially, partially on that this might work. Um, with AWS, it would cost you the same to run three tests in parallel and have an answer in three days. It's still the same number of compute hours if you're, if you're doing this on EC2. So you can do things rather quickly and in parallel. You only pay for what you use, so you don't have the problem of having laid out a, a bunch of uh, budget to buy equipment and then have it become obsolete before your next test. Uh, what, another thing that I like is that you have the ability to scale both vertically and horizontally. By vertically, we have a variety of different instance types. If you create a, a machine image for doing your tests, um, you can deploy that image uh, simultaneously on a range of instance types and in parallel run all of those tests and get an answer over, for instance, the cost performance of the different instance types for your application. The other thing that's good is you can scale horizontally, and we provide tools like Elastic, Beanstalk, and CloudFormation that make, make it easy to automate the deployment of complicated clusters of, of systems rather easily. Automation is really key because um, an, another um, great pearl of wisdom here, humans are unreliable. Um, in lots of ways, but particularly if what you want are repeat tests that repeat with results that you can count on, you don't want humans in that, in that loop. You don't want any differences in the results that you measure to be anything other than the system you're measuring. You don't want mistakes in how the test was run to be why things look different. So having all of the, uh, the services available in AWS have automatable APIs really helps. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to make the case that even if you're not using AWS today, you should at least take all of your benchmarking and, and do it on AWS. I am trying to say that AWS has a lot of advantages that you can take advantage of to benchmark. Uh, there are really three ways that you can use benchmarks to answer specific questions, and I have some examples of that coming up. Uh, the first and most important way, the way that I, that I recommend the most, is to, is to design and build benchmarks around your application, the thing closest to what you're trying to do. The second way you can um, uh, benchmark to answer questions is use a benchmark that someone else wrote. Um, I call them standard benchmarks, but they're benchmarks that were built for some other purpose, for some other person, and you can run those tests. The last and least desirable is that you simply go out and look for the results for tests that someone else ran on tests that you didn't write. Um, and I'll go through these in a little more detail. But first, uh, it sounds trivial to say, oh, just go benchmark your application. I will be the first one to tell you that although it's, it's doable, it takes some amount of planning and diligence to do it well. Um, you need to first pick what parts of your application you're going to test. Uh, you, you rarely will test every single feature and every single function. You need to piss, pick a subset of those. Typically, the subset is not so simple that you're just running like A or B. You're running combinations of A or B, and we call those workloads. Once you've got workloads, you can set performance targets. I've already mentioned that setting performance targets is really critical to deciding A, when you're done, or B, whether you need to rethink what you're trying to do. 
um, but you can't really set performance targets before you decide what it is you're testing. Once you've decided what you're testing and, and, and what that's going to look like from a configuration perspective, you can start defining the tests that you're going to run, how you're going to write those tests, uh, and, and what technology you're going to use to implement them. Once you've done that, you can decide how you're going to generate load. A hint here, again, humans are unreliable. So if you think that offering free pizza and coffee is going to get you a reliable set of experiments for people using your system, I'm sorry to tell you I've tried it. It doesn't really work. Um, there are a number of different ways you can generate load, but if you're going to test at scale, you need load. The goal here is to get, is to get data that you can use to answer the questions, so it's very important you think about what you're going to measure and how you're going to measure it. Once you have metrics, you can actually start thinking about what the report's going to look like. One hint, if you want to take a different approach to this whole sequence, what I like to do is actually start with this, this, this last step. I like to start with a mock-up of what the report's going to look like. Then I'm sure that as I go through these other steps, it's going to give me what I need to produce the report. But some people like to start in this, this other approach. Either one works as long as you're, you're, you're thoughtful about how you approach this. It's very important, and I can't stress this enough, that if you want reliable results, you have to run experiments in a controlled way. They need to be repeatable. You never run only one. And you need to use automation so that you get repeatable results. Um, once you've run the tests, you actually need to analyze the data. And there's a, I'll give you some examples of why analyzing the data is important. Then you can do, produce your, rep your report, and then you have um, answers. I'm going to spend a, a brief moment giving you an anecdote about what you don't want to do from, from my past. Um, I had taken over uh, uh, responsibility for an engineering group that um, was distributed in three parts of the world that uh, built the, um, the technology used for a very large public-facing website. Um, I took over this group right as they were ready to do a major launch. Uh, since I hadn't been with the group during the engineering cycle, I was just an observer in their uh, release review. Uh, in this review, um, I only asked two questions. Uh, they went through all of the features, and the business was saying, yeah, it's great, we're getting these features, and um, the operations was saying, yes, we're ready to deploy, and the bits are there, and we're, our tests have been run. And, and I, I understood from the requirements that they had an annual renewal process coming up. This was in November, so the renewal process was in January. I said, um, I understand that, that this is an annual process that has to be done within a certain period of time. Uh, being up and performing was really important. And they said, yes, that's correct. I said, what, what test did you do to, to validate that you'd be able to handle this next renewal cycle? Their response was, oh, well, we did this on our last release and we had great results, so we didn't really change much, so we're good. My last question was, what have you done to ensure that if you roll this out and it doesn't work, you can roll it back? I said, oh, we're good. We've got all the operations. has got the scripts. If it's not working, we can roll it back right away. So uh, roll forward, January. Uh, I'm actually in India for the first time visiting part of the engineering team. 3 AM India time, I get a call on my cell phone. The call is from my manager telling me that his manager's manager, which at this point was the senior vice president or something big in the company, um, had uh, been notified of a blog entry saying that he was I'll clean it up. He was not a nice guy, and that his system sucked, and that um, our company sucked. Um, th then the, uh, what followed on was that the system was failing. The worst part about this was we didn't have instrumentation that told us it was failing. We didn't have customer support calls that told us it was failing, uh, and that it was failing. Uh, fast forwarding to the end, uh, so we ended up barely getting through fixing the site on the fly. We didn't have a test environment. We didn't have tests. So we had to scrounge up a test environment and tests while the production system was going. We had to make live changes to the production app without knowing whether they would work or not because we had no way of testing them. We managed to get through that. It took four months after that to get a dedicated performance environment. You don't want to be in that situation. Trust me, it was not fun. No emergency benchmarking. So the second approach I said you could use was using a standard test or using a test someone else has written. A lot of the work is already done for you. The workloads are defined. Load generation is defined. Reports are there. That's all great. What's not done for you is telling you how those results, once you get them, are relevant to answering the question you're trying to answer. The other part that's not done is saying how that test is implemented is relevant 
to your application. You still have to do some legwork. You still have to do some extrapolation going back to my example. There's some margin of error that you, that you introduce every time you extrapolate and you have to figure out how much risk you're taking and taking these results and saying, yay, verily, the system is good. Uh, one of the recent examples that I had of using a standard benchmark was prior to, two weeks prior to the release of DynamoDB. Uh, and to refresh your memory, if I can recite this right, we claimed on release that DynamoDB offered single millisecond service side latency, uh, um, which is a mouthful. Uh, and I'm not a part of the engineering group, but one of my jobs is to validate when, when we're making performance claims that customers are likely to get that. So I had two weeks with no testing um, set up to, to try and do this for large scale tests. Um, I looked around and I found a, uh, a database called, uh, a benchmark called YCSP, Yahoo Cloud Serving Benchmark. What I liked about it, it, it was simple, um, it was extensible, uh, and I could quickly build a plug-in for DynamoDB to run tests. When I say it's simple, um, it offers very primitive um, uh, actions like read, update, um, write, uh, delete, scan, etc. It gives you default workloads, it gives you tools to generate load, it gives you reports. So it basically give, gave me almost everything I needed. And for the purposes of answering the question, does DynamoDB scale and does it provide single digit service side latency, um, it was adequate. So what I did was I, 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 I ran some tests. And um, so the first thing I'll do is show you some results from, to, to answer that question. What I did was uh, I ran, uh, this, these are results for one of the workloads. Workload C happens to be 100% read. Um, but I ran four different types of workloads. And by the way, yes, I ran them in parallel because I had very little time. Uh, so um, I provisioned 100,000 requests per second and I ran the 10, 25, and 50 all at once, got those tests done, and then ran the 100. So it shortened the life cycle of doing them each independently. And I was able through other tests to validate that it didn't mess up the results to run them at the same time. But what this shows, the, the horizontal um, uh, axis here is millisecond latency. This is a histogram, so for instance, this is 10,000 RPS. Um, the sum of those major bars you see there between two and say seven is greater than 95% of all of the requests. By the way, this was, this was on a billion rows, a terabyte of data, so it was not a small scale test. Uh, and these are all single digit client side latency. And if the client side latency is single digit, I was pretty certain that the service side latency reported by CloudWatch was accurate. But this is a 10,000. Uh, I then, this is 25,000. Uh, this is 50,000, if I'm, Pushing, yeah, and there's 100,000. So in answer to the question, does it scale? And again, is it single digit service side? Very likely for this workload, for this testing environment, that, that's, a good, that's a good thing to say. Um, I mentioned earlier that analyzing data is really important. And here's, here's what I call you know, extra double overtime bonus gold. Um, when you're running tests, sometimes there are interesting answers to questions you hadn't even thought of. And since I was new to working with DynamoDB and there was no data on running large scale tests, by the way, I, I tried to minimize the complexity of my testing. So I initially started testing with CC2s as my clients. That may sound, if you're familiar with CC2s, that's like the biggest instance type we have. Massive, massive uh, um, uh, 32 proc um, uh, servers. Um, I had tried to use the minimum number of clients just to make my testing easier. What I found initially was I had dialed in throughput and I wasn't getting it. Now, I've been doing this long enough, I know that means a bottleneck, and you never leave a bottleneck sitting there, at least not understanding where it's coming from. So what I did was some debugging and I found out that the default for the Java SDK for DynamoDB was to have debug logging turned on. What you see here is a graphic depiction of what the effect of having a log file as a bottleneck does to throughput. Um, prior to launching, we updated the SDK so that the default was not debug. But this is gold. When you look at results, sometimes you get answers you weren't looking for. Um, another example of, of using a standard benchmark, um, I, I have a second talk tomorrow that goes into much more detail about how I ran these tests. But I was asked prior to the release of, 2000K, uh, of 2K 
uh, provisioned IOPS, how well those were working and whether they were uh, working as advertised. And so I used a, a tool called FIO to generate a, an elaborate series of tests, testing a whole different series of write patterns and, 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 and uh, write types. Um, one of the things I noticed was that if you over drive, if the queue depth is too large, with a provisioned service, at some point if you use more than you've provisioned, what's going to happen? It's going to get throttled. And what happens to latency when it gets throttled? Latency goes up. So these two arrows point to what happens. Uh, the latency is almost double. And the difference between these two charts is a queue depth of one and a queue depth of two. So um, uh, what I would caution you on, particularly with any provision service, um, particularly if you're testing I.O., never just look at throughput, never just look at latency. Always look at throughput rate, latency, and queue depth because you typically need to look at all three of those. The last, uh, the last uh, way you can use benchmarks in, in the three categories I, I posited were useful uh, is to use published results. Now, I've, I've, I found this slide. I thought it was kind of funny, so I had to share it. Um, n not all tests are great tests. And sometimes that's not intentional. Uh, sometimes it is. And that's why it's really important that you ask some critical questions before just using the results from a benchmark that someone has published. Uh, you need to trust not only what's being measured, but why. Make sure you understand how relevant it is, and then whether you trust the publisher. There's an expression, you know, comparing apples to oranges. I've found a nice slide that sort of mangled them together. I see a lot of these uh, benchmarks that, whether intentional or not, really aren't telling you what they say they are. Some benchmarks aren't fair by design. If you can't read this, uh, the examiner's sitting in front of a variety of animals. He's saying, the test will be to see who can climb the tree fastest. And the monkey um, and probably the, uh, the, the bird are very happy about this test. Um, it turns out the monkey uh, wins. The bird was disqualified because they, climbed. they didn't climb, they flew. Um, but the goldfish was really pissed because it was kind of beyond. Uh, I, I have a, a short uh, list of tests that you should use to look at any benchmark result. The first, the first question you have to ask, is this really relevant to me? Um, it, if I run this test, is the answer going to be really something I can use? I've said this before, but I, I can't stress that enough. The second one, it may seem obvious, but is this test result recent? Um, uh, is this using technology that I use? Is it current? Or um, if I look at these results, is it, is it, is it not going to be the same because of the changes in technology. Very important that a test is repeatable. How many people remember, uh, I think it was 1989, cold fusion? Physicists claimed that they'd been able to do it in the lab. Uh, unfortunately, neither those physicists nor anyone else could ever produce the same results. I understand now that there's, there are people who are saying, well, it wasn't cold fusion, but it was a new form of energy, and we should figure that out. But the point is, you, if you can't repeat a test, then the probability of it really telling you something important is pretty low. And, and mostly, uh, the last thing is the test is not only the test reliable, but the, um, the publisher reliable. When I say is the test reliable, there are some benchmarks out there that if you run them 10 times in a row, you will get a standard deviation greater than 100%. Meaning, um, nothing to do with what you're trying to test. The test is just flawed. And that's not the kind of test that you want to count on for making a business decision. So the last. Part of this um, talk, I will actually walk through an actual benchmark published result. I've, I've cleaned it up to simplify it uh, and to, and to um, be able to focus on, on, on my points here. This benchmark claimed that, um, sorry, click fast, claimed that uh, vendor Y, which I've got in blue, was up to five times faster than vendor X. Um, there were lots of problems in this benchmark. First of all, what they were, where they got the five times from was instance, uh, the, the instance five on the bottom, uh, which has four processors, was being compared to instance one in X, which has one processor. And if you're doing a CPU performance test comparing a four, if, if a four processor system isn't better than a one processor system in a multi-threaded test, well, that's something, but uh, not quite as exciting as saying that they're five times better. 
The second thing was there were actually some flaws in how they, what data they chose to use. Um, the data they used for uh, vendor X, the, uh, the uh, orange data, um, was all run on CentOS 5.4. The data they chose to use was uh, all run on Ubuntu 10.4. In fact, I don't think they actually ran the CentOS tests. I think what they did was they found published results um, that had been run on CentOS 5.4. I looked up the, uh, the data on that particular um, uh, OS release, and uh, it was from 2009. Uh, so it was old, and theirs was re relatively close to when the benchmark released. Uh, so that, that really wasn't a, a, a good comparison of the CPU capabilities. But there were also some very simple mistakes in the data they used to produce the graphs. Analyzing the data, I found two errors. One was a cut and paste error. Uh, where they, they, were, they just got the offsets wrong and where they were pulling data from. The second one was a, was a formula error where they used min instead of max. Some tests higher is better, other tests lower is better, and selectively on vendor Y they were all correct, but on vendor X they were wrong. Um, and since they were trying to show vendor Y was better than vendor X, I guess I would assume that they weren't very careful about looking at this, but uh, correcting that graph changes significantly without any new data, what the comparison would look like. But then, oops, sorry. If what you do is um, take all of these things and take the, the systems that are most comparable and you, you, you run them on similar hardware and similar OS, the actual results using their data were that vendor X was almost two times faster than vendor Y. That's different than 5x. But more importantly, people rarely have the luxury of saying, I want the fastest thing. I don't care what it costs. I always try to look at cost performance. So taking the same data and taking cost information, where lower is better, the cost performance was actually 2.13 times better for x than y. Now, I, I went through this in excruciating detail to show you that you need to be careful when you, you go out and just pull results that someone else published. There could be problems in the relevance of the data, but more importantly, there could be problems in the way the tests were actually run, how they were analyzed, or how they were reported. And that matters. Uh, there's an interesting blog post that, that walks through a series of questions you should ask about published results um, that, that, I, that I agree with a lot of the points made there. I do want to say that not all benchmarks are bad. Uh, in the past uh, few months, there have been three benchmarks in particular that dealt with um, AWS that I thought were, were, were um, well done. And I'm not saying I thought they were well done because I liked the answers they got. I, I, it, it's really that I thought the, the work done, um, the, the methodolo methodology they used, the precision which, with which they documented what they did, giving you the ability to run the test yourself, was really well done. Uh, so there are good ones out there. You just need to be careful when you get them. Uh, so, I've, I've been gabbing quite a bit, and unfortunately at a high rate of speed on occasion, I've noticed. Um, I'd really like to, to sum up key points I'd like you to take away, and then I have time for some questions. And by the way, um, this dispenser I will put on the table here. I need the dispenser, but you are free to dispense your own dark chocolate M&Ms, no nuts in there, um, after we're done. Um, first. If you're going to do benchmarking, you want to have specific questions you're trying to answer. Secondly, the best benchmark to use is the one as close to what you're trying to measure as possible. Third, standard benchmarks are useful tools, particularly when you're, you're trying to isolate or find bottlenecks. But there is still work that needs to be done to, to extrapolate from what those benchmarks give you to your application. Uh, as a last resort, you can use published benchmark results, but I'm sure I don't need to tell you tell you this, not everything on the internet is true. I, big shock, I know. I won't say anything about the Easter Bunny, but yes, that's true. Uh, I, I appreciate your patience in putting up with my warped sense of humor and my rate of speech. Um, I do have time.